So now we are finally ready to talk about energy and wave motion. So one more time, I'm going to go back up here and reference. So we said the two things that we're interested in are the displacement of the particles of the medium as the wave travels through it, and the energy that's propagating along with the wave. So we started with the displacement. We found the wave, uh, the wave function, then we used that, took some derivatives, found the wave equation, and we have everything we ever wanted to know about the position, velocity, acceleration of the particles. Um, and then we found the uh, wave speed in terms of some more fundamental properties of the, uh, of the material. And that uh, allows us to now talk about the energy as it propagates. And so last time, we went through this curious uh, thought process with a segment of string to arrive at that wave speed. And we're going to do the same thing this time with a segment of string again. But now, instead of thinking about the forces that the rest of the string on either side is exerting on the string, on the segment, we are going to consider the forces that are exerted onto the following segment by our segment, because we're looking at the propagation of energy. And we know that energy is propagated this way along with the wave. And so we're looking at, based on the motion of how this particle does what it do, how does the energy end up going from here to over here, right? That's our general question. How does that occur? So let's look back at this segment. Segment like this. And it's defined by an x-axis down here. But this time, we only care about the right side because the right side is where all of the energy transfer occurs. And this time, it's the force that our segment is exerting on whatever the rest of the string is. And so if it's a tension force, then that force would be pulling on that, that segment to the right. And so that means that we have a tension force that's exactly in line with our segment at that point, something like that. But back, back towards our segment, it's pulling the string together, you can think of it as. This is the force that's keeping each segment of string together so that when one moves up, the subsequent one also reacts. All right, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to break it up into components. All right, Fy. This one we're going to continue to call F here. So just like before, we know that the direction of the force is exactly in line with the slope of the string segment at that point. And so we can draw up that same exact relationship between the components of the force and the slope of the string. We just have to be careful about our negative signs. So in this case, because the force is pointing in the opposite direction, we would have a negative Fy, and we're using the magnitude again, so a positive F. And so that would mean that if we said Fy over F, which is rise over run to declare or define the slope, that really would mean a negative slope, but the slope is positive. So if we're using those quantities to define the slope, then we need to stick a negative and sign in there to flip it, to say negative dy dx, right? So it's a very similar thing as what we did before, it's just the force is pointing in a different direction. Okay, and we're only considering the right side because we're just thinking about energy as it propagates towards the right. So that means, I'm going to switch back over to right white here, Fy and x t is equal to negative f dy of x and t dx, right? Just writing it a little bit more explicitly. So remember that the x component of the force is due to the tension in the string, 
um, but it doesn't change because there's no this way motion of any of the particles. This is a transverse wave, so particles are only moving up and down. They're completely restricted to up and down motion. So that means that whatever the x component of forces that we have identified are, um, there is no net x direction force. There's no net x acceleration. There's no net x displacement. And so uh, it's only the, the y component of the force. Um, and this y component of the force depends both on the position and the time that we're talking about. And so that's why we wrote this out explicitly, whereas this f here, it doesn't really depend on anything. Um, it's just going to cancel out. There's no net f. All right, so the rate, so putting this aside for just a second, the rate at which work is done, so work, if you remember work, um, is is power. So work per second is power, right? And work is force through a displacement. So therefore, we can write power, power as a function of x and t in this case. We can write it as fy as a function of x and t times vy as a function of x and t, right? So this, this v gives us the displacement here, maybe as a displacement, I'll say times some x. Um, so that, so, so that it doesn't signify seconds. So that gives us our meters up top and our seconds. So it's force times the distance, distance divided by time. Hopefully that all kind of checks out in your mind. So that's power. So we can expand this using our expression that we set aside back up here. And we can stick this guy right in here. So now we'll say power as a function of x and t is equal to negative f y x t divided by, I mean, uh, as with respect to x. And let's write this a little bit more explicitly. This is partial, uh, partial derivative of y with respect to x. I mean with respect to t, t because it's a velocity. All right. So this right here is um, the instantaneous rate of energy transfer along the string. And you can read from the equation that it depends on both x and t, so the x position and the time. So that, that's a kind of interesting. It means that energy isn't transported uniformly at all locations along the waveform, even though there's very periodic, smooth motion going on. Um, it really depends on the position and then the time, uh, how much power is being transported, um, how much power is being done. So if we look at this a little bit closer, you can prove to yourself that energy is only transferred at the points where the slope of the string is non-zero. So no energy is being transported at these points here. Why is that? Well, think about it. If we were to look at segments here, right, just short little segments, and do the exact same analysis that we did, that segment would be flat. There'd be no, uh, there'd be no, when we, when we go from delta x to dx, right, there'd be no y component of the force, because it's just, it's, it's flat. So the force would be back this way, and there's an x component, that's the entire thing, but there's no y component of the force. So then when you have everything de depending on the y component, well, when that cancels out, then there must be no power being transferred. So that's kind of interesting. Um, that's something that you may not have expected to come out of this. So that means that the maximum amount of power is being trans uh, transported when the slope is maximum. So like right about there, um, 
well, maybe not based on how I've drawn it, but something close to like this in real life. Those midway points between peak and trough, that's where the maximum power is being transported. And if you imagine uh, sending wave pulses down a rope that's just laying on the ground, um, that kind of, at least in my mind, checks out as like the, the most active place. That's where you're lifting up this part of the rope, right? And once it passes that point, well, then they're kind of slowing down again um, because they're just kind of, they're cresting that peak there. But it's right here that it's like maximum lift. So that kind of checks out in my mind. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm just making that up. Okay, so uh, this equation of energy transfer here is valid for uh, any wave on a string. But if we are strictly talking about a sinusoidal wave, then we have some neat specific equations that come out. So if you have that specific motion going on um, where your wave function is a cosine kx minus omega t, then as we saw, we have just a nice long laundry list of things that we've kind of gone through already. Ax minus omega t, nothing new yet. If you also, if you take a derivative of y with respect to t, you have omega a sine kx minus omega t. And I won't continue with the second derivatives, but we're going to need these in here for the power because I'm just writing out these here to stick into the power equation. So we have then that the power as a function of x and t is equal to f times each of these multiplied by each other. So, uh, and, and with this negative sign canceling out with the other negative sign. So, k, let's do a better k than that real quick. k omega a squared sine squared kx minus omega t. And if we use omega equals nu k, and what we derived before, that nu squared equals force over mass per unit length, then we can get power in terms of some fundamental quantities of the motion and the properties, the physical properties of the string. All right, so equals square root of mu f omega squared a squared sine squared kx minus omega t. So make sure that you can go through that with yourself. So let's pause here and look at this real quick. So um, the maximum energy transfer occurs when the sine squared term is equal to 1. Because sine squared is never going to be more than 1. At most, it's going to be 1. And so p x t max must be mu f omega squared a squared. So that's the maximum power in a wave, the maximum energy propagation. Um, we can also say that the average power, p average, I'll just do this, is equal to one half of the max, omega squared a squared. But what I want to point out is that this sine squared term can never be negative, no matter what you're plugging in there. And so that's just a nice little self-contained proof right there that energy is never back propagated, reversed to the direction of the wave propagation. It's always in the direction of the wave propagation. It doesn't matter what you're plugging in because you have that sine squared term. So that's kind of neat. 
All right, so we've done most of the mathematical stuff, all the mathematical stuff. Um, congrats for sticking with all of that. Next, we'll talk about some qualitative topics, and we're going to end on talking about normal modes um, and kind of sort of how some string instruments work, um, but also some more complex systems. Alrighty, we're almost there.